Church, if you got your Bible with you, if you'll go ahead and turn to uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, as we continue our series in the fruit of the Spirit, cultivating, cultivated in His character, and we look at the fruit of the Spirit, peace. We focus our attention today on the fruit of the Spirit, peace, and as we uh, gather for worship here today, we're reminded that our chapel choir is in Colorado. Uh, about 120 students and adults are worshiping with some of our church planners. Pastor David is there with them today. So we want this week to be faithful in prayer for them as they are um, serving alongside of and worshiping with our church planners there. And they have a, a week full of ministry planned alongside of them. So we want to be faithful in prayer for them this week. We draw our attention today to the fruit of the Spirit, peace. It's important for us to be reminded as followers of Jesus, as we have these last three Sundays or these last two Sundays and continuing today, it's important for us to be reminded that uh, as Paul says here in Galatians chapter five, that we are at war with the works of the flesh, that in cultivating the fruit of the spirit, we are at war against the works of the flesh. And we need to cultivate in his character, we need the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us as we seek to wage war against the works of the flesh. Uh, some of you know this, that there is a, there's a group of our staff that enjoys uh, going a couple of times a year. Uh, sometimes we don't get to go twice, maybe once a year. And we go spend time in God's creation doing a backpacking trip. We'll go for three or four days at a time, depending on how our, our schedules work out. We try to go once in the fall, once in the spring, but that doesn't always uh, pan out that way. But one such trip uh, took place uh, almost three years ago. It was October 31st of 2018. Uh, we decided there's eight of us on this trip. That's the, the largest group that we've had. There were uh, six staff members and two church members. And throughout this story, I'm going to try not to use any names to protect uh, both the guilty and the innocent. Uh, but I may need to mention John Wood's name at, at some point just to, to pick on him a little bit since he's not here to defend himself. Uh, but it, we set out on October 31st, 2018. And since October 31st is Halloween. We decided we would leave uh, later that evening so that we could have some time to collect candy with our kids. So we set out from here at 7 p.m., uh, which was the first bad idea of the trip. So that meant we're leaving here at 7 our time. That's 8 Eastern time, which meant that we would get started on the trail sometime between 12 a.m. and 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We were going to the north part of Georgia. We would actually be crossing over into North Carolina on this particular hike. And so we're excited about it, but we didn't get there till sometime around 1230, pulled into the trailhead, got our packs on, got our headlamps on, got our flashlights out. We take off. We have four miles to go. So that meant that, you know, somewhere around three, four o'clock in the morning, we arrived to uh, where we were going to camp for the evening. And we set up camp. We sleep for a few hours. We get up the next morning and uh, one of our, our team members had decided that uh, in that first four miles, he realized that he had bitten off more than he could chew. So the next, um, 10, the, the next three days, we had planned 10, 12 or so miles a day. He's like, hey, I, I don't need to attempt that. I'm just going to be slowing you guys down. So he went back to the vehicle and he said, hey, I'll try to figure out some ways. Maybe I can meet you along the way. So he took off back to the vehicle. We took off headed north on the trail. And we knew that there was rain coming in. Uh, we didn't know exactly when it would arrive. But uh, early or mid-morning, as we're hiking, the rain comes in. It's light rain to begin with. Uh, by, as the day went on, the rain just got harder and harder. We're just hiking in a downpour. There's seven of us at this point. We're just soaked, uh, soaked to the bone. It doesn't matter how good of rain gear you have in that kind of weather, you're, you're going to get wet. Uh, so we're, we're hiking. And as we're hiking, getting kind of later in the afternoon, early evening, I start hearing rumblings that uh, one of our team members has been in touch with the one who has the vehicle and that they know there's going to be a dirt road that we're coming to where he could possibly meet us and uh, take us to the nearby town of Franklin, North Carolina to get uh, a hotel room and we can get out of the elements. We can get dry for the night. If I'm being honest, I didn't like that idea. I said, look, we're, we're, here, to, uh, we're here to camp. We can tough it out. We'll be all right. Uh, but the closer we got to the van and the wetter we got, the more I liked this idea. And we get close and then we start walking up to the van and there's pizza in the van. So he had gone to get us pizza. So we're really very grateful for that. So we get a couple cheap hotel rooms. We pile eight of us into two hotel rooms, get up the next morning. He takes us back to where he had picked us up so we can make sure we get the miles in on the trail. It's raining again that morning, still raining. 
So we're hiking in the rain, we're, we're wet. About midday, we decide to stop at one of the shelters along the Appalachian Trail. Now, keep in mind, uh, some of you may be familiar with this, it's not like a log cabin, it's just like a little structure to get you in out of the elements uh, to sleep. And so we uh, pull in there midday to uh, eat lunch, eat some snacks, and kind of hopefully let the, the rain die down, dry out a little bit. And as we stop there, the rain does stop while we're sitting there. We're trying to get some stuff dry. Uh, while we're, we're sitting in there, uh, a hailstorm comes. So the rain actually died down, and then a hailstorm comes. And we're just laughing. We're like, man, what, what's going to happen next? So we, the hailstorm didn't last very long, 10 to 15 minutes. We continue hiking. The rain actually subsides late that afternoon. We're wet. And that, it was Friday night. Now that temperature just starts to drop. I mean, it's just dropping, dropping, getting cold, getting cold, getting cold. So we ha- were able to get a fire. Uh, there's now two people that were in the van. They were able to, uh, they were able to um, catch up. They were able to park somewhat close to us and hike in and camp with us. Uh, so we rendezvoused with them. We got a fire. We're, we're keeping somewhat warm, drying out a little bit. Uh, that night we go to sleep. Again, temperature just dropping. We sleep all night. One of our staff members said that's the coldest he's ever been in his life. It just got chilly, so cold that we wake up the next morning, everything that was wet from the day before is now frost. There's frost all over the ground, frost on our tents. Uh, we, we start packing up, you know, hands are frozen, packing up the tents. We start moving along the trail to get warm. Saturday, which just happens to be the last day, beautiful day. We just have a few miles left to get to our vehicle to finish our, our hike for that, that particular trip. And so we get there, get to the van, again, beautiful day, turn around, drive back to Birmingham. And as, as I look back and reflect on that trip, there's a lot of really good memories, a lot of them that I left out, a lot of really good memories from that trip. But the one thing I remember is all, all I wanted throughout that trip was I just wanted a break from the weather. I, I wanted just, I wanted peace. I wanted peace from the storms. I, I wanted just to enjoy, uh, we, we wanted to just enjoy a nice hike on the trail and spend some time together outdoors, fellowship with one another, enjoying God's creation. And, but all I wanted was peace from the storms. And, and it may not be the literal weather storms that you are facing, but maybe it's the demanding stress of a family to manage. Maybe it's the demanding stress of a family. Maybe it's pressure at work that you are having to endure. Maybe it's a strained relationship, a difficult relationship where there is a lot of conflict. Or maybe it's just the, the anxieties of life in the short term or the long term. Long term. And, and these storms, these, these trials, these difficult seasons in life, they remind us of how we long for peace. And, and we need to be reminded that peace often comes through conflict. Sometimes it takes war to have peace. In difficult relationships to iron out that conflict, it takes much prayer. It takes difficult conversations for us to have that peace that we long for in that relationship. Our our very salvation that we have through Jesus and his death, uh, that we have through Jesus and his death on the cross comes with a battle. It comes with a war where Jesus went to the cross waging war against sin and death so that we could be at peace with God. And the reason that we often lack peace in our lives is because we want to be in control. And, and we seek to do things our way. But, but peace cannot be produced by an outward change or a system of self-improvement that we uh, put together for ourselves, but it's cultivated as we abide deeply in Christ and God works through us to confirm us, to form us to the image of his son. And so what does this peace that Paul is talking about look like in the everyday life of a believer? Let's look at Galatians chapter five, verses 22 and 23. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. This third fruit of the Spirit, peace, it, the word peace is, is used about 420 times throughout the Bible. And in the New Testament, there's five ways that it is used. It, it's used as peace as the absence of war or chaos. It, it's peace as a right relationship with, with other people. It's peace as an individual virtue, and it's peace as a word of Christian greeting, that you see that in Paul's letters. He would often say, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament, the word that's most often used for peace is shalom, which is a Hebrew word that is loaded with meaning. It's all around well-being, or it's freedom from fear and want. It's contentment in a relationship with God and with other people. But what is the fruit of the Spirit that the Apostle Paul is talking about here when he uses the word peace? And to to understand this, we need to start with the peace that God gives 
us, the peace that God gives to us as his people. And first, that is peace with God, that we have peace with God through the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross for our sins, that he went to the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and for my sins. That's not something that we do, but it's something God does for us through Jesus Christ so that we can experience this peace. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 18, we get one of the clearest examples and explanations of this in Scripture. So if you have your your copy of God's Word there and you want to flip over to Ephesians chapter 2, we'll read verse 11 through 18. It says, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the circumcision by what is called the the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and he might reconcile us both to God and one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we have access in one spirit to the Father. Jesus Christ is our peace. The peace that God gives comes through Jesus Christ. We have peace with God because we are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And we believe that Jesus died on a cross for our sins, thus making us at peace with God. That when we trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are at peace with God. We're no longer enemies of God. We are made right with God. And so I wonder this morning, I ask you this morning, do you have peace with God? Do you, do you know this peace? Have you experienced this peace with God? Have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior where you know this peace with God? Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace that God gives us is peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And once we have peace with God through Jesus, we have the peace of God. Peace with God and the peace of God that he graciously gives to us. This is, this is the peace of mind that God gives us. It's freedom from anxiety. It's freedom from panic. It is tranquility of the soul. When we use that word tranquility, it allows us just to kind of take a deep breath and rest in the peace that God gives us, peace that is unrelated to our circumstances. It's unrelated. It doesn't matter how good things are going in our life. It doesn't matter how bad things are going in our life. We have this peace of God with us that transcends all understanding, transcends all circumstances. Jesus taught us about this peace and and not to be anxious in Matthew chapter 6. He taught us to trust our heavenly Father. Matthew chapter 6, verse 28 through 34, if you want to turn there and follow along, says, Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Don't worry about these things. Don't be anxious, but seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Then he says, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. That Jesus is saying, hey, trust your heavenly father. Trust your heavenly father. He will take care of you. And then the apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, he echoes this teaching. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything. Again, don't be anxious about your circumstances. Trust your heavenly father in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. So don't worry, but pray. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the peace of God that he graciously 
gives us. Charles Spurgeon, that great Baptist preacher in the 1800s, often told a story about a woman and her husband, and they were on board a ship, and she was often greatly distressed in the midst of storms, while her husband would remain calm and restful. And it's important for us to know that her husband was the captain of this ship. And so the the woman went to him one day and said, hey, how, how is it that you stay so calm in the storms while I'm so disturbed and so distressed. And he he didn't answer her with words, but he took out his sword and he held it close to her. And she smiled. And he says, how is it that you smile when I hold this sharp sword close to you and, and I could kill you with this in an instant? And you know that, how is it that you smile? And she said, I'm not afraid of a sword when it's my husband who yields it. And so said he, neither am I afraid of a storm when it's my father who sends it and who manages it. And then Charles Spurgeon goes on to say, now since all the trials and troubles of this mortal life are as much in the hand of the great God as that sword was in the hand of the good woman's husband, we need not be afraid of them. For they are all in his power. When he rides aloft in his chariot and the skies tremble at the sound, why should you tremble, even you timid ones? That's the peace of God that is a settled trust in God's fatherly care. It's a steady refusal to give into anxiety. It's a, it's a choice to not worry, but to pray and to trust God that he will give us his peace that passes all understanding. And a life filled with this kind of peace is a powerful testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a powerful witness because it is through the gospel of Christ that we have peace with God. It's through his death on the cross for our sins that we are at peace with him. And the way we cultivate the fruit of the spirit in our lives is to abide deeply in Christ. It's not about polishing our halos. It's not about keeping up a picture perfect image that everything in our life is okay and that we have it all together. That in fact is a false picture of the gospel because the gospel is the opposite of that. The gospel is that God loved us while we were yet sinners and sent Jesus to pay the penalty for our sin. So cultivating the fruit of the spirit in our lives is about allowing Christ to work in us and through us to walk according to the spirit, to make him visible and to display the power of the truth of the gospel. See, that's what the captain of the ship knew. That's what he knew. He, he knew that Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, that God's son, that when there was a storm in the midst of the Sea of Galilee, a fierce storm, Jesus can rest peaceful, peacefully in the boat and sleep while his disciples are full, full of panic and anxiety and worry because he knew that he could rest in the tranquility of soul because he had the God of peace with him in the midst of the storms. And so we need to be reminded that we have this same peace of God with us every moment of every day. So when anxiety creeps in, when the worries of life try to get a foothold, be reminded, church, be reminded, Christian, that we have this peace of God with us. And he is a God of peace who gives us his peace to sustain us. So we know peace with God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And because of that peace, we have the peace of God with us. But what is the fruit of the spirit peace that the apostle Paul is talking about? He is calling us to live the peace that God calls us to give. He's calling us to be the peace that God calls us to give. He calls us to give the peace of God and to live peaceably with all. God calls us to live at peace with others and to work for peace among Christians and among all people. That is the fruit of the spirit reflected in our lives. It's It's how we practically live out what the Holy Spirit is working in us in the fruit of the Spirit, peace. And for this kind of fruit to be cultivated in our life, it's like a vine or a tree. We have to cultivate it. We have to work at it. We have to prune it and we have to cut out the works of the flesh and we have to fill ourselves with the work of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. We're called to be peacemakers. And the apostle Paul, he urges us to make every effort to live this way. And one of the best places for us to reflect on what the apostle Paul means here is to go to Romans chapter 14 and Romans chapter 15, where Paul is writing to the church in Rome, a church that has Gentile Christians and has Jewish Christians that come from different backgrounds. They're now united in the name of Jesus Christ. They're now united under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, but they come from different backgrounds. So they have different opinions about, they have different views about uh, religious rituals that they used to practice and that they should continue practicing. They have different views about Sabbath laws. They have different views about clean and unclean food. 
And Paul is writing to them saying, hey, 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 church in Rome, you're, you're dividing and you have disagreements among you about disputable matters. Paul wrote a lot of his letters he wrote to contend for the truth of the gospel, to contend for the indisputable matters. Things like the virgin birth of Christ and his sinless life and him going to the cross for your sins and for my sins and God raising him from the dead on the third day. Those are indisputable matters. But there are disputable matters that creep into the church and you and I know this and we can sometimes be at odds with one another over disputable matters. And Paul is saying, be at peace with one another in these disputable matters. Agree on the core indisputable matters, be united in those and then in these little disagreements that can be disputed. Be at peace with one another, respect one another, accept one another. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Look at verses one through 12. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord, and he gives thanks. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Paul's bottom line instruction here is seen in verse 19 on down a few verses. Let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. He he reinforces this instruction that his bottom line instruction with several different points throughout Romans 14 and 15. He says, as Christians, we're accepted by the same Lord. We have the same Lord. We're united in his name and in the truth of his gospel. We're all servants of the same master and only God has the right to judge. So who are we to judge our brothers and sisters? We all live to please the Lord and whatever we do is done in his presence. We're all accountable alone to God as judge. We're accountable to one another to live as God has called us to live, but only accountable to God as judge. We are not the judge of our brothers and sisters. And we are compelled by love for God and love for one another. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it is the love of Christ that compels us to love him and to love one another. And then in chapter 15, following chapter 14, here the apostle Paul says in verse 7 in Romans 15, therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. He points us to Jesus as our example of what it looks like to walk in the fruit of the spirit. That what what it looks like for us to live the fruit of the spirit, peace, he says, is to accept one another, to work hard and to live at peace with others, even when they disagree. It means to have the mind of Christ that when we gather for worship, we sing in unity together to the glory of God. We hear from the preaching of God's word in unity together for the glory of God. We serve on mission here locally in the church and around the world to spread the hope of the gospel. And we do that in unity for the glory of God to live at peace with one another. And the source of this peace with one another is the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. The power of the Holy Spirit working in your life, the power of the Holy Spirit working in my life. It's not, a, a, it's not simply a nice, happy feeling. It's not, it's not like we talked about last week with joy. It's not a, a nice, happy feeling that peace is, but it is a sense that God, our heavenly father, we can rest in the peace that he gives us. It's at the heart of the gospel. Us living together in peace and unity displays the power of the gospel to the world. That Jesus said, by this, all men will know you're my disciples. What? If you love one another. And part of that loving one another is to live at peace with one another and to be agreeable with one another, to live peaceable with all, even on those small disputable matters that we may disagree on. 
We are to live together in peace and unity to show the power of the gospel and the power of the church of Jesus Christ. So Paul says, cultivate the fruit of the spirit in your life and walk by the spirit and not by the works of the flesh. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse three, we read about from Isaiah, the the peace that God gives us, knowing his peace that he gives us as you keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. That's the first part that we talked about, that when we trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, we have peace with God and we know the peace of God that is with us. Though it's not related to our circumstances, that it guards us, it guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus when we present our request to God with thanksgiving through prayer that we trust in God's sovereign care for us, his, that he is our heavenly father who cares deeply for us. So Isaiah says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. We have the perfect peace of God with us. And then the apostle Paul, two chapters before he writes Romans chapter 14 in Romans chapter 12, the apostle Paul calls us to live at peace. He says, if possible, if possible, so far as it depends on you live peaceably with all. This is the fruit of the spirit cultivated in our life that leads to us living at peace with everyone. It says, as far as it depends on us through the power of the Holy spirit working in us and through us, Live peaceably with all. Live live at peace with everyone. Accept one another. Respect one another. Love one another. Be united together in the power of the gospel and cultivate the fruit of the spirit in your life and agree with one another. Be agreeable with everyone. Be at peace with everyone. This is the fruit of the spirit of peace cultivated in our life. That as far as it depends on you and me, we need to live peaceably with all. Let's pray together.